Grace and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to the study of the great Psalms of Ascents. We began that study in Psalm 120, and we're going to Psalm 134. Fifteen Psalms with a recurring theme, and there's a certain rhythm to the Psalms of Ascents. There is, for example, uh, Psalm 120, trouble, trials, tribulation, and then Psalm 121, there's trust, trust in the Lord. And then Psalm 122, there's triumph because of that trust. And so it goes. And, and as we're climbing up the mountain of God to the, the temple of God, the, the pilgrims back then would sing these psalms and remember what God has done and how they trusted in him and, and how he gave the victory. And it go, this goes on for 15 psalms. The theme, trouble, trust, triumph. Trouble, trust, triumph. And in the last, uh, last psalm we studied, Psalm 128, we looked at the biblical family, and now we're back to the time of affliction in Psalm 129. This is a difficult psalm to study because there's not uh, too many pleasant topics here, but life is like that. In fact, every psalm we have studied is a metaphor for life. Um... Everything we go through, whether it's a beautiful family that we, are, we, we, we studied last time here, or uh, the, the, the condition of our soul where we trust in the Lord, 121, Psalm 122, and the way he gave us the victory and so on. Everything that we go through in life is addressed here in the Psalms of Ascents. So let's study now, because in, in the first uh, four verses of Psalm 129, we see affliction on the, on the people of God, the nation of God back in those days, which will be Israel. And today in the church age, it will be the church. And how, and then we're going to go into some, uh, some ways we can uh, address these, these uh, situations and circumstances. But then we get to verses 5 through 8, and we see an imprecatory prayer. Now, when we see, where we see an imprecatory prayer, that means uh, we're calling, uh, basically, a uh, curse or a judgment on, uh, on, on enemies of God. Now, remember, there's a distinction here we need to note. An imprecatory prayer is not to be prayed against a human being. We don't pray for uh, someone who hates us, uh, someone who's done us wrong, whether it's uh, a, a close uh, friend or family or, 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 or fellow employee or boss or whatever. We don't pray them imprecatory prayers against them. And precatory prayers is praying the enemies of God into the hands of God. And when we get to um, study that, we will see that, how we can do that. So remember, imprecatory prayer and curses is not for the Christian to pray against people. We are supposed to pray for our enemies and for those who've persecuted us and those who have done us wrong. And then we pray the enemies of God into his hands because there will be no escape in, in that situation. So just briefly, that's uh, what an imprecatory prayer is. Let's start reading Psalm 129, verses 1 through 8, and we read, Greatly have they afflicted me for my youth. Let Israel now say, Greatly they have they afflicted me for my youth. So that's repeated twice. Yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed upon my back. They have made long their furrows. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. Verse 5, May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backward. Let them be like the grass on the housetops, which withers before it is grown up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor the binders of sheaves his arms. Nor do those who pass by say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his holy and precious word, the praise and glory of his name. Amen. So remember the rhythm here is trouble, trust in the Lord, and triumph. But what does it mean um, they have afflicted me for my youth? Now remember, this is uh, the people of, of God at, in Bible days, the nation Israel. Uh, and uh, and um, 
God has not changed his mind about Israel being his uh, favorite his fa if most favored nation. But he's extended the grace uh, to all humanity, the Gentiles. So on, on that day, when we call before him, there will be no distinction. And the, the only distinction will be, have you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah? All, world, all the world will be held to that same standard on the terrible and wonderful day of the Lord when it comes down to the sheep and the goat being separated. So, affliction and survival. Now, the nation Israel has survived, as we know, for that, these many years. Uh, it is estimated that Abraham was around uh, uh, the, the father Abraham, who had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. He was around uh, the year 2000, 2200 uh, to 2000 B.C. When he left Ur of the Chaldeans, or uh, Baghdad, or Iraq, and that Babylon, that same area there, and came uh, and crossed over, which means he became a Hebrew. He, the word Hebrew means crossed over. And he went into the land of Canaan that God had promised to his, uh, his future people. And for 4,000 years, the land of Israel has survived and will continue to survive into the, uh, into the future, foreseeable future. That's because God has protected it. Um, there were many times, uh, as I, I think uh, I mentioned before, that the, the city of Jerusalem, the city of God, has been attacked 44 times and taken into captivity numerous times or, or besieged and on and on and on. And the uh, last time was it was destroyed in uh, AD 70 by Titus, the Roman general. It was surrounded and it did not become a nation again until 1948 A.D., in the year of our Lord. And currently, in 2020 and beyond, we see peace treaties being made um, with the former enemies of Israel and the land of Israel, uh, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, and uh, Sudan, and so on. And according to President Trump, uh, there will be more people signing on to treaties. And we know, and the, and the very end, as prophesied, uh, when when uh, all this time has gone by, that that the, the, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, will be making treaties with with Israel at a final treaty. But let us not concern ourselves with that. When he says here, "They have afflicted me from my youth, but we have prevailed," he's talking about survival. The, Israel, the land of Israel has survived. Now let's take it down to modern times in, 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 in a wider concept, the, the church, the body of Christ with the Jewish Messiah uh, who has set up this paradigm and this uh, into place so that we can uh, uh, grasp the kingdom of God and what it means. Now the church is under persecution right now, increasingly. Uh, and I'm not talking about just ISIS and decapitation and all that sort of thing. I'm talking about what's what's going on, uh, like for instance in China, technology has been used as a tool of persecution. Um, they, they right now they're giving credits to those who uh, who behave themselves in the eyes of the pagan state. Um, the president of China, Xi, has uh, knocked all the crosses of the churches in, in China. He has replaced uh, photographs of, of what people think artists' uh, conception of Jesus Christ with pictures of himself. And basically, uh, like all the pagan kings of the past, he, the president of China has declared himself God. Basically, that's what he's done. And they've been using the technology, which is advancing rapidly and which will be used by the Antichrist against the people. He's using that against the church to persecute him even further. And uh, it is estimated that over uh, 322 Christians are killed monthly around the world. Almost 300 million are in under persecution. Uh, that includes the almost the over 200,000, the over 200 million of Christians in China, and then the rest through the Middle East, India. Uh, North Korea, and so on. But I'd like to tell you, uh, in, in plain, stark terms, in 2020, I'd like to list for you some of the names of countries of the world that are persecuting the people of God. 
And we, um, this is from a verified list from Open Doors USA, which is, uh, and uh, Open Doors monitors persecuted, the persecuted uh, uh, saints. There's another website called persecution.com where you can uh, go visit sometime and read all about this. But Open Doors every year updates its list where the people of God are persecuted and treated worse than uh, sometimes uh, animals. The number one persecutor of the church per capita is North Korea. North Korea, the little short guy, little short fat guy who uh, who lives like a king while his people starve, um, persecutes Christians. And you're saying, how can Christians, uh, how can there be any Christians there? That's because a lot of Christians, uh, North Koreans, who become born again uh, and, and get out, escape from North Korea, go back in with Bibles at the risk of their own lives to save, uh, the, to help save their fellow man by bringing them the knowledge of the Word of God so they can uh, know about the Lord Himself. The second most dangerous country in the world for Christians is Afghanistan. And we have been uh, defending Afghanistan for going on 19 years for absolutely no reason and losing uh, military people to defend these people who are, uh, who are persecuting the people of God, Christians. Now, those people who made the decisions to do that stuff will stand before God one day and account for it uh, as, as far as enabling uh, people. But that's where it is, Afghanistan, uh, Somalia, number three, Somalia. The number four country with the most persecution per capita is Libya, followed by Pakistan, followed by Eritrea, which is right next to Ethiopia, which is actually, um, which is, uh, strangely enough, was a has a connection for the, to the Jewish people uh, through Solomon. Numbers, the number seven uh, country for persecution of Christians is Sudan. Now, Sudan has just signed a peace is, uh, re, a treaty with Israel, and we'll see what happens after that. Number eight is Yemen. Number nine is Iran. As we know, many Christians have been persecuted in Iran. And number 10 is India, where, where radical Hindus are burning down churches and basically starving uh, Christian villages and so on. And we can go on. Number 13 is Saudi Arabia. Number 12 is Nigeria. Number 15 is Iraq. Now, Iraq was, was, is, is, was way down until the Iraqi War of 2003 when uh, the President Bush had left, um, uh, authorized a war to go into Iraq and uh, topple a dictator named Saddam Hussein, who actually, and strangely enough, uh, was protecting a one million Kolian Christians around Baghdad and who are now, uh, who have been chased out of there and dispersed all over the, the world in the Middle East. So instead of being a protector of Christians for 2,000 years, Iraq is now a wasteland. Egypt and so on. And then uh, you're thinking, well, all of these kind of countries are uh, you know, on the other side of the world. Well, true. But you got Colombia on this side, you got Venezuela, you got Cuba. You got um, you know, Brazil in, in a certain sense and so on. So those are some of the countries that are persecuting. Uh, the, this, is, this is the latest list from 2020, October 2020, of, uh, of those countries that are persecuting the people of God. Visit again persecution.com or opendoors.org. Open doors if you go to Open Doors, Look for something called the watch list. The watch list is, uh, describes the, the persecuted church and the people and um, how they arrived at those numbers because there are people, are Christians in there, who actually get the information out. Uh, we are not totally uh, without, um, without tools to protect uh, Christians or, or, to, or to alert the world about them so we can pray. And which leads me to a, uh, uh, something else. Starting Sunday, November 1st, 2020, starting Sunday, November 1st, 2020, and all through the month of November, is the annual International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Because we see all this list here. We see our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, who, are, who are basically persecuted and, and to the point of losing everything. Now, in the United States and the Western world, we are facing persecution in a different way. Uh, the, the pandemic was used to close down churches. Uh, in several states, especially on the West Coast and the Northeast Coast, 
uh, churches are still shut down, and uh, uh, in Chicago as well, um, the mayor of Chicago had used uh, the police to go uh, shut down one church and, and, and arrest the pastors or something like that. So it's not that the United States is immune from this stuff. The Bible tells us when one is persecuted, the whole entire body is. And we are supposed to pray for them. And the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, IDOP, happens every year. And But, you know, we shouldn't wait for once a year to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are persecuted. We should be doing that all the time. But how do we pray for our persecuted brethren? The Bible actually tells us how. Um, I got five points here, and I got these five points from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Association tells us how to pray for the persecuted church. If you want to find out more about the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, go to persecution.com, and you can, uh, you can download the, the prayer points. You can also... Uh, find ways to get an actual DVD to show in the church and resources so you can uh, engage other Christians to do what we should be doing in the first place, praying for our people. So Billy Graham Association gives us five points on how we can pray for the persecuted church during the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church in November all through the month of November 2020 and every November after that. The first thing we do is we pray for those in the middle of the persecution. Obviously, we pray for those in the middle of the persecution. As I mentioned before, every month 322 Christians are killed worldwide for their faith. So we pray for them to stay committed to Christ even through this, trib uh, this horrible time we pr and committed to Christ, and yet love their persecutors. Now, that is a hard thing, a hard thing to do. Love those who are killing you, but Jesus shows us how to do it. Um, remember when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen, the first martyred disciple in the book of Acts, when he was stoned to death by uh, the religious fanatics, including a man named Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, said, Father, do not hold a sin against them. So here was a man who's teaching us the example how when we're persecuted, do not hold this against them. And, and the key verse for this point, of uh, point number one of five, is Hebrews 13.3. Remember this. As we pray for our persecuted brethren, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated because you also are in the body. See what it says there. The Word of God says, Remember your brothers and sisters who are in prison as though you are in there with them, and those who are mistreated since you are in the body. We don't have one Western body and one persecuted body in another part of the world. We're all one body of Christ. So those who are more fortunate need to pray for those who cannot uh, have the same freedoms that we have under the Constitution of the United States. Ver uh, point number two of praying for the persecuted church according to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association is to pray for those who are doing the persecuting. So the first thing we do is actually pray for our people first. That's most important. But the second thing we do is pray for our people for those who are persecuting our people. And, and, the, and the verse for that is Matthew 5, 44. Matthew 5, 44. Uh, let's briefly look at that, and then, uh, because we're going to go back there and later on when we're talking about imprecatory prayers. Matthew 5, 44 says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's the biblical uh, foundation for that. Number three, pray for the families and the loved ones of those who are being persecuted. Pray for the families and loved ones of those who are being persecuted. And the key verse for that is Hebrews 4, 6, 16. Hebrews 4, 16. Let's go there. Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 16. And um, right now, I am using the English Standard Version, the ESV. 
And it says, Let us then be with confidence, let us then with confidence draw, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Now, 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 how, now remember this is about praying for the families and loved ones of those who have been grabbed and, and, and thrown into prison. Uh, in China, uh, they're grabbing the pastors and, and sending them to labor camps and concentration camps. They, in some sense, they, they're just as bad as the Nazis, these Chinese uh, communist people. And that's why you don't want communism to come to this side of uh, this, to the United States or you know, the Western Hemisphere and, and because they're, they're godless, the first thing about communism is that they remove, they remove uh, any mention of God and any worship of God. Their founder, Karl Marx, said, religion is the opiate of the people. Religion is the opiate of the masses. And they use all kinds of terminology to make it sound nice, but basically what they are is doing the work of the devil. So, Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then, as we pray for the comfort of those who are being, who are who are left behind when their when their loved ones, like the leaders of churches in China and Iran and so on, are being uh, persecuted. Let us then, let us go with confidence. Confidence. The word confidence is a, a Latin word, that is from two words actually. Con meaning with, fide faith. Let us then go with faith. To the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace. In a time of our need, so then, so the, the, that was the, that's the third point there of praying for the persecuted brethren. Pray for those in the middle of the persecution. Hebrews thirteen three. Pray for those who are doing the persecuting. Hebrews 5, uh, Matthew five forty four. Pray for those who are. Pray for the families and loved ones who are those who are persecuted. Hebrews four sixteen. And number four is pray for our churches to rise up and stand with our persecuted brethren. Most churches in America do not even know that uh, brothers and sisters in Christ are persecuted around the world because our, our, our lives are revolve around what we see. And that's understandable, but it's up to the leaders of the church to lead and tell them we're part of a worldwide body for God so loved the cosmos, the world, everybody in the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we are supposed to be doing uh, uh, much more than we are for the persecuted church. How do we do that? We, how can a little bitty uh, church in a small town, a small farming community, uh, help a church in another uh, way across the world where no one knows or cares about us? Well, first thing, the first thing we do is we pray. That's the easiest thing anybody can do, pray. But it, now you're not just saying... Uh, you're in my thoughts and prayers. People who are not even saved or don't believe in God say that. You're in my thoughts and prayers. You have to actually think about what you're doing here and then pray intentionally. We pray for their physical uh, safety. We pray for their financial need, for provision to be made from them, for them. Because even if we, for instance, took up an offering and sent it to... Uh, uh, open doors or one of these uh, other places. It's, it's difficult for them to get that across uh, the pond or wherever they are in the underground church in China or Iran. So God has to make a way. So we pray for God to make a way for provision for them. And sometimes God can supernaturally provide for them even from their enemies. And then we also pray, we, we petition. We, and when that, that means we, we talk to a, a congressman we send a letter on we hear if we hear something going on uh, in a church in Turkey or uh, a pastor or a certain group being persecuted in this part of Iran or so on, we, we we write a letter to the congressman and say, Congressman, would you mind looking into this, please? Now most congressmen will, um, might have somebody respond to you with a form letter, but you've done your part, and but and you keep doing it. You keep asking them. The, um, the United the, the U.S. government has a uh, has an agency. The, uh, specifically designed by, uh, by, I think, some of the recent presidents for religious liberty around the world. You contact those people and tell them you're interested and you want to pray for them. So, and the verse for that can be found in Acts chapter 4, verses, verses 23 to 35. I'm not going to read 12 verses, 
But, it, but write that down. Pray for the churches to rise up and, and be involved in praying and acting on behalf of the persecuted church. And the, and the scriptural reference for that can be found in Acts 4, verses 23 to 35. And the final point to praying for the persecuted church during the International Day of Prayer, where we can prevail, and you know, ultimately, we will prevail anyway, because God is going, Jesus Christ is going to uh, descend with a shout and send his angels to gather us up and the church will be raptured out of here. And then uh, the book of Revelation will unfold on on those who are not saved, and they will be taken care of uh, one way or another. We pray for all the leaders of all the countries of this, of this world, especially those who are doing the persecuting in persecuted lands. So, so remember now, we're covering the spectrum. We're praying for the persecuted church. First of all, we pray for all people first, and we pray for those who are doing the harm to them. Then we pray for the families and loved ones of those who are being persecuted. Then we pray for our churches to do something about it. And finally, we pray for the leaders of every country in the world, not just in the secular United Nations, which is not which is anti-religious freedom and anti-Christian, but, but individual presidents and prime ministers and, and whatever around the world. Pray for them, including dictators, uh, generals who, are, who assume leadership in certain countries at a point of a gun. They can be reached by the Lord. And the scriptural reference for that is Psalm 2, verses 10 and 11. Psalm 2, verse 10 and 11. Let's, let's get to that. Now, Psalm 2 is a really powerful psalm. You want to look at that because that has some trouble for some of these people who are, who are mocking God. Psalm 2. And that... The reason, one of the reasons to pray for some of these leaders, uh, presidents and prime ministers and so on, is that they have a responsibility to protect people. And not, not, not just a constitutional responsibility. They will stand before God to give an account when the books are open in the book of life. Now, the books, they will be judged uh, before the great white throne, uh, most of them because they will uh, have rejected God. But... Excuse me. They have a responsibility to protect people, and because they're a leader, they are answerable to God. Remember this thing about leadership. If you want to be a leader in this world, whether it's in ministry or something else, you are more accountable. You know that in, uh, on the job. A foreman is more responsible than the guy with a hammer uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a circular saw. Um, the Sunday school teacher, the, the minister, the preacher, he's more responsible before God. And, and James warns us about that. If anybody wants to be a teacher, remember you're going to be held more responsible uh, or accountable. And so it is with these leaders of this world who think they get, they're skating away and, and who think that God does not see uh, what they're doing. They are responsible, so we pray for them that way. So here's what the, the scriptural reference for point number five of how to pray for the persecuted church. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with prayer, with fear, and rejoice with trembling. This is a warning to the leaders of the world. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Serve the Lord. Now, most of them don't know they're accountable, or they don't care, or they don't believe it's going to happen. Well, it is going to happen. So, there. So that's how we pray for uh, our persecuted brothers and sisters. I know I took a long time with that. But then, what about, the, I, I talked about this being in three parts. Affliction and, and, and prevailing and survival. Um, we talked about the nation Israel in the first four verses here. And as we, uh, and we talked about the church, the body of Christ. That was, that was very important. But what about the individual how can we uh, prevail when we feel afflicted? Now, we can be persecuted too by circumstances and uh, many things that come against us in life. And in fact, no matter who you are in this world, uh, from the person you think has got it all together, all together the most, to the obvious uh, example uh, who is probably going into the psych ward, everybody is under some sort of duress at some time or at all times. 
everybody, um, you, you've heard the, the term, uh, he's got this, he or she's got a personal demon to deal with or a personal affliction. Well, wh what are these so-called demons that in fact, even the best Christian from time to time? I'm just going to name a few, and we won't go deep into this right now, because that's these are time uh, things for another uh, program and another podcast. But each human being ever born has had fears. That's why the Bible says so many times, "Fear not, for I am with thee until the end of the age." Anxiety, we all have anxiety uh, from time to time. This fear, we have all this fear. Frustrations. You, you may not think of them as demons, but they are, in a, in a certain sense, things that attack our souls, that attack our, free, uh, our peace of mind, attack our hearts. Low self-esteem. How many people who you think actually have it together or actually think really badly of themselves? Their opinion of themselves is so bad that sometimes it affects the way how they act as life goes on, if the thing if the thing is not addressed, you know the Bible tells us to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. You cannot love your neighbor as yourself until you love yourself, until you understand yourself, until you understand your uh, your identity, which can only be found in Christ, and then love who you are, in order that you can love someone else. That's why Jesus came down in the form of a man, the divine incarnation was that he can understand what we are going through as, as human beings so that he can minister to us in our time of need. And because he is God now, and both God and man, he can stand before the Father and be our intercessor. How about jealousy? That's a demon. Envy. Inadequacy. Uh, we don't have as much as the other person down the street. We don't have a boat. We don't have a fancy car. We don't go on vacations or don't have, a, don't have a cabin or a beach house and so on and so forth. Uh, disappointment is, uh, you may, again, you may not think of these things as demons. Heartaches, things that attack people, heartaches, guilt. Now, guilt is a big thing. Uh, uh, now, remember when Jesus freed you from your sin, he took away the guilty stain and, and put it, uh, when we got to the foot of the cross, and he washed it with his supernatural blood and created in us a new person. If anyone be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things, the old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come in. And symbolically, after we are saved and cleaned up and washed by the blood of Christ, and we get baptized, uh, which is symbolic only, you do not get baptized to save, no matter what some people say, or what some people practice. When you're baptized, you go down to water, symbolically, as the old, dirty old man, and he come up clean and fresh, down, and he, and he come up uh, born again, symbolically, into the kingdom of God. So guilt is a big deal. Um, it's, it's a demon. Some people have so much guilt about so many things, from the most serious thing to the stupidest thing. It's amazing. It's incredible. When God gives us his peace, he takes away our guilt and shame. Now, we can continue to sin and, and, and bring more guilt on ourselves than we uh, deserve or that ne that is necessary. In fact, uh, if we do some stupid things and keep doing them, as we've all done in the past, well, but there's a way to, to, to stop that because the, the propensity to sin decreases over time as you become more and more sanctified in the Lord through prayer, supplication, and studying the Word of God, and walking uh, in fellowship with others. Sin actually goes away, and so does guilt. And now, a lot of people say, well, a lot of Jewish people have guilt, a lot of uh, so-and-so denomination has guilt. That's just uh, making excuses. God has His Word here to wash away our guilt and our shame, and all we have to do is fight it that way and prevail. And depression is also a big problem. Depression is a big problem uh, with great born-again Christians, as well as the great Tommy Nelson is a, is a good example. Tommy Nelson is the most famous pastor from, from Denton Bible Church uh, in, in Denton, Texas, which is just north of Dallas. I think it's northwest of Dallas. It's a beautiful town. Uh, 
It was pretty busy if you're going to drive through there. Whoa. Tom, but Tommy Nelson is an amazing preacher, great men's minister, great teacher, Song of Solomon for couples, and, and you listen to his, uh, his, his sermons on Sundays and over the last decades. He's an amazing man. No one knew he suffered from depression. He, he went all over the country doing all sorts of great things uh, for the word of, for the kingdom of God, but he, had, he, was, he was deep into the depression, so much so that it affected him, and he ended up with a heart attack. So these are the, the things that come against us. These are the afflictions, but we can prevail. In this life, we will have many troubles, but behold, I have overcome the world. How do we defeat these demons? First of all, with Jesus. Yes, Jesus. It's a, now, it's not a simplistic answer. It is Jesus, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus, I mean. When we're born again, He sends His Holy Spirit to live, to live within us, and He uh, shows us the way out, how to beat this off, and with, with proper counseling, with proper uh, direction, with proper teaching, uh, and proper uh, fellowship and upbringing and mentoring, we can defeat whatever afflicts us so that we can walk in, in, in victory and triumph more than a conqueror because God has showed us the way and has sent His Holy Spirit to live within us because He is God, He knows us, and He is always there for us. But, the, but first of all, we have to be honest with Him. We have to be honest with the Holy Spirit because He lives in us. He knows we're lying when we're lying. We have to be open, and we have to be open to change, to changing our ways. We have to be, come clean at all times and be willing to commit to Him and, and uh, to stand on the Scriptures. You know, the Holy Spirit is, a, is an amazing uh, person of the Trinity of God. He lives in, in believers. He, the Spirit of Christ lives within us, yet He does not force us to do what we don't want to do. Now, the Christian has a certain choice. We can become as, as good a Christian, uh, as knowledgeable as we want, to be walking in righteousness as, as, as well, as powerfully as we can, or we can, afford, or we can just sit in the back pew um, and do nothing and just skate into heaven. Either way, we're going to heaven, but um, there, there's a reward for those who are walking in righteousness and those who are uh, doing it in a, in a powerful, intentional way, getting all they can in this side of life uh, and doing the best they can for the Lord. So, and then the next thing is we should be aware of our need for Christ and to always be in the alert so that we don't fail. James tells us, resist the devil and he will flee, uh, James 4, 7. We renounce Satan and we refuse to sin and we always look forward to receiving Christ's intervention in our lives. So, we defeat our demons with Jesus Christ. Let's, re let's read quickly Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. Ephesians chapter 3, as we go to the last part of the verses here, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, 16 and 17. According to the riches of his... Okay, let's read the, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every, every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. The Holy Spirit, I tell you, is the way, as I just told you, is the way to defeat the demons in your life. He has shown us how through His Spirit, and Paul confirms it here. Thranking with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you have been rooted and grounded in love. So again, the Holy Spirit is the one, is God who shows us how to defeat our demons. And the imprecatory part of this prayer we will not get too much into it because uh, we can talk about this in a, in, in a more extended version in the future. But let's read verses, uh, verse 1 and so on. Verse, sorry, verse 5 of Psalm 129. May all who hate Zion, all who hate Israel, anti-Semites of this world, be put to shame and turned backwards. Let them be like grass on the housetops. Uh, back then, in, in those days, the, as you know, the roofs, most of the roofs were flat. And they had gardens on them, so that's what he's talking about there. May they be like grass on the, on the housetops, and, 
and because of seasonal changes, the grass did not last long. Just like here, um, if it's fall, the, the leaves are falling off the trees, and the grass is basically uh, lying fallow or dead until the spring. Let them be like grass on the housetops, which withers before it grows up, and which the reaper does not fill his hand, and with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor the binder of shears his arms, nor those who pass by the blessing of the Lord upon you. Now, this may not sound too imprecatory or too mean, but it is. Here's verse 5. May all who hate, all who hate, that's a powerful word there. Hate is a powerful emotion and a powerful thing, a concept. Not just all those who hate Zion, but those who hate the people of God. When the Bible talks about hating Zion, um, it, by extension, it extends to everybody who belongs to God uh, through the end of the age. Remember that. They, they will be, and, and he's praying here that they be uh, the disciple on the way to ascending up to the temple of God. May all those who hate God be put to shame and turned backward. That's not, a, that's not an easy prayer because if you study that and you go through the Bible, you will see that God was going to deal with these people. Psalm 1, if you go back to Psalm 2, verse 4, he's talking, and well, from actually 1 to 4, well, he's talking about those, why do the heathens rage and the people imagine a, great, a vain thing? He, verse 4 says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. He scoffs at them. God knows what's coming for those who hate his people. And when you hate God's people, you, you by extension, you hate God. Because any rebellion against God is taken out on people. It, it's a, it's a, the action of those of, of the wicked towards others, to those who are innocent, and those who are the people of God, is is a is a, a reflection of what's in the in the heart, the evil and dark hearts of human beings, which God sees and God will judge. And, but God told us. Uh, tells us, uh, let me see, let me give you a fast scripture verse here, Romans 12, 19 to 21. We'll read that quickly, and then we're going to read uh, what's going to happen to some of these people after you pray that imprecatory prayer, uh, because though the day is coming, and coming soon, when God will deal with these people. Verse uh, 19 and 20 to 21 of Romans chapter 12 says, Beloved, never avenge yourself. Again, God is warning, warning us here. That's why we pray the enemies of God into the hands of God. We pray for on, on a horizontal level for those who are persecuting us personally. And we pray for the persecuted church. But we pray for the enemies of God. We pray them into the hands of God because uh, he, will, uh, he will restrain them in, in a lot of circumstances, even most circumstances. But their day is coming. Verse 19, if, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, be over, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, do not misunderstand what imprecatory prayer is. I and mean, the precatory prayer is not about us doing bad things to other people. We are told here to be loving our enemies on on this level. But at the same time, we have a purpose. We have a we have a duty to pray because if you're going to believe all the Bible, you're going to believe all the Bible, cover to cover. We pray the enemies of God into the hands of God and leave it right there. And then walk away and, and go about our business serving the Lord with gladness. Because if you read Romans chapter 2, verses 6 to 11, you will see what will come of them. We will not get into that now, but that's what the Bible tells us. And But the Psalm 129 doesn't leave us not uh, hope without hope. Because as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a recurring theme in these 15 psalms. Every, every three psalms were the first one, trouble, trust, triumph. Trouble, trust, triumph. And 
Psalm 129 ends with this. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. No matter what we're going through, no matter what demons are coming against us, we will prevail because the blessing of the Lord is upon us, because the Holy Spirit lives within us, because we are children of the living God. Join us again next time for Psalm 130. May the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. In Jesus' name, amen.